now let me give you a quick overview of static routes. So a static network route or static route is composed of two different pieces. Piece number one, type of, it's a manually configured route that defines a subnet or an entire class A, B, or C network. Next, you can either specify an outgoing interface or a next hop IP. So here's how the syntax looks. On the router, and we'll do this in CLI in a moment, here's what we type in. On the router, we type in IP, route. We specify the network that we need to specify. We specify the subnet mask of that network. And then finally, we specify the next hop IP address. So the next hop IP, this is the subnet mask, this is the network address, and then th these are the keywords, IP route. And that's how we create a static route on a router. Here's another example where instead of the next hop IP, we have the local interface specified. Specifying the next hop IP in the static route is considered a best practice design. Specifying an Ethernet interface, for example, is not considered good because if it's a point-to-point -point interface, you're fine. But if it's not a point-to-point -point interface and if it's like an Ethernet segment with multiple devices on it, every single time you're expected to route traffic to that interface, it's going to generate a broadcast and that broadcast will be sent out to all the devices. So it's not considered good practice to specify an interface. Instead, you should always have a next hop IP configured. Reviewing the show IP route command shows a different output in the routing table for each of the static routes configured above. So what I'm saying is that for each of the IP route statements that we have specified here, whether we have the next hop IP or the interface specified, the, the output is gonna look different. And I'll show you that in a moment. When the router interface associated with static route fails, the router automatically removes the static route from its routing table. So now let's quickly go to the CLI and look at this stuff. Now let's quickly take a look at this routing scenario here right in front of us. So about router one right now, and I'm gonna look. go ahead and take a look at show IP interface brief to see what's going on. And it seems like I have an IP address of 10.0.0.1 configured. See if I can ping the other side, which happens to be 10.0.0.2. And it seems like I'm able to successfully do that. So router one is able to ping router two. Now router two happens to have a couple of different routes. 192.168.0.0 slash 24 and 192.168.1.0 slash 24. Two separate subnets behind its LAN. Now router one by default is not gonna have the ability to see those routes. To verify that, we'll look at show IP route. This is the routing table. And as you can see here, routing table has this codes section. So we, what we can see right below that is the different networks that are in our routing table. And C corresponds to the flag or the code up here in the table, which stands for connected. So this right here is a connected route and it's on our interface gigabit zero 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 and this and this happens to be the slash 30 our local route which is the l flag here is 10.0.0.1 slash 32 now this is called a host route because it's a very specific route it's a slash 32 and it's also directly connected over gigabit ethernet zero 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 so if you guys remember the administrative distance chart we were looking at this has an administrative distance of zero because it's directly connected. It's considered to be the most 
believable. Now, we got a bit of a problem here. We cannot see the routes that Router 2 has. These 192.168 routes. Now, before we do anything, let's quickly jump to Router 2 and look at show IP interface brief. Make sure everything is up and running. And indeed it is. And what I've done is I'm representing these routes as loopback interfaces because it doesn't really matter. I mean, I could ha have other layer three devices hanging off of this router if I wanted to, but I'm just trying to simplify the configuration here and it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Let's quickly take a look at show IP route. So if I do that, I will see that I have a bunch of routes that I've specified. Once again, for every route that, or for every interface, I'm gonna see two different entries. One is the host specific entry, and that has a flag of L right next to it. And then I'll see another entry, uh, which is the C entry, the connected route. And that is the network that I specified when I was configuring my interface. So let me quickly sh show you what I mean. So if I were to do show run, let me show you how I've specified these interfaces. Loopbacks are slash 24s, as you can see here. The gigabit 000 is actually a slash 30 because it ends in dot .252. Now, if I were to look at the show IP route, the reason we're seeing the loopbacks with slash 24 and slash 32 is slash 24 represents the subnet that I typed in here, right? Which was dot zero. But because I have specific IPs on the interface, it automatically inserts a host route. So this is not something I inserted. This is the operating system automatically inserting the host route just so it has a specific entry in its table. So I just wanted to quickly point out that distinction. Now let me jump back to router one. We still have a problem. I can't ping, for example, one of these subnets that router two has on its LAN side. And I'll prove to you that I can't ping either one of them. Both networks are currently unavailable on router one. And the reason is router one doesn't know where those routes are and hence is unable to get to those destinations. So let's go ahead and enter those routes manually. That's what's called static routing. We'll go ahead and set that up. So IP route 192.168.0.0. Then I'll type in the subnet mask. And finally, I'll type in the next hop IP here, which for us is 10.0.0.2, which happens to be the router 2's interface pointing toward us. Now let's go ahead and do ping 192.168.0.1. And voila, we have much better luck this time around. Now, if you were to look at show IP route, you'll clearly see that we have an S flag, which stands for static, meaning I manually typed it in. And as you can see, it clearly spells out the network address, the subnet mask, and the fact that it has an admin distance of one and metric of zero. So it's very, very believable of course, directly connected will always be preferred, but then right after that would be the manually typed in static route. And it specifies the next hop IP that we typed in of router two. Let's go ahead and now add the other route, IP route 192.168.1.0.255.255.255.0. Oh, and in, this time around, instead of specifying the next top IP, I'm going to go ahead and specify my local outgoing interface to Word Router 2. And as you can see here, the operating system on this router is 
giving me a grief. It's barking at me. It's saying default route without gateway, if not a point-to-point -point interface, may impact performance. And that's what I was alluding to earlier, that we're gonna have a lot of ARPing going on. And if it's not a point-to-point -point link, we might have performance issues because our ARP table is gonna get pretty big and we're gonna have broadcasts going to different devices. Now let's go ahead and look at our show IP route again. And this time around, as you can see, it appears in our routing table a little differently. Uh, the first part is the same. So the network and the subnet mass is the same, but this time around it says it's directly connected. And once again, directly connected is preferred over the static route. But remember, this is not a good practice. This is actually a bad design to specify a next top interface instead of the next top IP. But I just wanted to show you two different ways of doing this. And one final thing is to do a quick verification check and make sure we're able to reach the new subnet that we just added. And indeed, we are able to do that. Now let's quickly take a look at show ARP. And sure enough, we have those IPs specified in our ARP table. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, give me a thumbs up, hit subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.